Welcome to the best of series in Wesley Impact. As we wrapped up recording for 2013, we had many favourite shows that viewers requested that we share again. Today we revisit our interview with an Australian household name. It's a favourite. At just 20 years of age, he won Olympic gold in the 200 metre freestyle at Seoul. A quarter of a century on, and he now shares more than just his medals. Amid the popular recognition, Duncan Armstrong shares how he found the one thing that would fill the ache and void in his life. Duncan, welcome to the programme. Thanks, Kate. Thank Good. you. Let's take you back to that moment in 1988. Mm -hmm. yeah, lots of people will have asked you about this. Uh, all your hopes and dreams of, of, of years of what I know would be intense training come down to a minuscule period of time. But a very important minuscule period of time. It was one minute and 47 seconds. That was the world record. And, and I had that world record in, in my vision, up on my walls, everywhere that I, I spent my day um, in goal setting. And it was one minute and 47 seconds. And I spent five years chasing one minute and 47 seconds. And then on the 19th of September, 1988, I hit it. One minute and 47 seconds. And that was good enough to win the Olympic gold medal in Seoul and break a world record. So all my dreams and um, all my aspirations came down to one touch on the wall and a world record. Look, if, I don't want to be rude, but you must have been unbearable to live with. It to... was fairly unbearable. That's not rude. That's... that's... That's true. I was very unbearable to live with. My family, I had two brothers and two, two sisters and my mum and dad. And, um, you know, uh, I took my swimming very, very seriously. I took myself very, very seriously. I had a very serious coach, Laurie Lawrence. We had one of the most brutal, antagonistic, competitive clubs in the country and we got those results because of that. So my swimming was everything to me and I was a very, very focused person. And your coach was an important person in your mm. life. You know, we talk about mentoring. He was a very, very dynamic and, and yeah. also focused person. Yeah, Laurie really understood what the Olympic equation was, that on one day every four years, the best in the world assemble under the five rings to compete, mm. to win 364 gold medals, 364 silver and bronze. And so uh, I wanted to be one of those 364 people and I found the coach who really understood the Olympic equation and how to produce a young man to, uh, to achieve that against a lot of great odds, that I wasn't the world record holder. I was ranked 48th in the world. I'd never broken a world record. I'd never won a significant title except a Commonwealth Games. So I went there with great hopes, but not a great deal of credentials. And I had a coach who really understood that and didn't care. Mm. And so when we rolled into Seoul, we got it absolutely right. Swam the perfect race. And everything's a competition, really, when you're in that kind of mentality. Everything's a competition. Yeah. Everything's a mind game. Everything's a, that headspace of um, getting in front of people in traffic, um, getting in, in front of people in a queue, getting in front of people, getting in front of people. That's a complete headspace. Mm -hmm. And I lived it. And I was good at it. And, and then, then that comprised you with the kind of the information, the, mm -hmm. the experience that leads you into motivational speaking and yeah. leading other people. Yeah, you know? that's right. Like, I, I was very privileged in my swimming career um, and Laurie brought a lot of people to the pool, including, including rugby test captains and, and uh, cricket test captains and, and uh, people who have achieved great things. And they imparted their stories and really got my vision up. Of, of how to live my life. So let me compete with you now and say, just stop a minute. We're going, no. to, come back. We're going to come back in a minute. We're just <laughs> going to carry on. I want to introduce today's performer. John Newsom has chosen a song that fits well with Duncan's journey. It's called Heaven Opened Up. Every breath, every thought, every long night to now, every word, every line, every ambition to now. All it up to you. All my prayers, all these songs of a labor I've done, all the roads I've walked, of all the prizes I've won, none compare to you. Heaven at this plea when I fell on broken knees. Heaven opened up and filled the holes in me, the holes I could not see. All this hope, all this joy, all this beauty I found takes the soul on a road I thought I'd never walk down all because of you all this love all this truth this gift to my soul filled up holes deep inside that I'd never have found if not for you oh I
Keith Garner's new book, A Word for the World, is now available. Dealing with the four themes of success, sorrow, society and spirituality, the 16 sermons in this book will definitely inspire and challenge you as you read. The book also includes a DVD featuring interviews with Nick Farr-Jones, Lee Hatcher, Tanya Plibersek and Margaret Somerville. For more information on A Word for the World, please contact us on 9263-5555 or at impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. Look, if you want to know more about John Newsom and his music, his details are going to be on the website this week. Now, Duncan, I'm, 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 I'm fast forwarding. Uh, I'm in charge of the race for just a second to say uh, you, you're doing the motivation speaking, mm. but there comes a point where you've done that commentating and all that goes with it. Mm. Um, but there's a disillusionment and, or a desire for something more and somebody invites you along to a church mm. and you say your wife catches on first rather mm. than you. What really... Um, happened to you then when you both asked Jesus Christ into your yeah. life? What really was that all about? Oh, well, we, Disillusion, and that song is a very, very good song that we just listened to. You know, the lyrics of that song is basically my life. There was lots of holes um, that uh, only Jesus could fill. So my wife, um, we, with conspiring with a couple of our friends, got us along to church, and, um, and I remember sitting there and, and just feeling the presence of God, and, and it's quite overwhelming and... and um, and my wife and I had been going out, Rebecca and I had been going out for about eight years and she really hadn't seen me cry at that stage. And, you know, and then I just found myself weeping and blubbering and, and uh, it's not pretty. You know, there's a lot of snot and there's a lot of tears and there's a lot of, you know, but uh, basically I was having this really, really heavy duty moment at church and, and I really didn't know how to um, get away from it, to tell you the truth. It really scared me half to death because as a swimmer, you're a control freak. Everything you do is control. This is almost totally against the kind absolutely, of life that you... Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I've found with my relationship with Jesus ever since, that it's nothing, exactly nothing what I expected. Yeah. Um, and my impressions at church has been nothing, which I thought I knew something about. And, um, you know, and I just keep on opening up different parts of my life with Jesus' help that I never thought I'd ever get to. Or ever enjoy. And the scriptures become more important than you ever thought mm. they would be. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, I came across uh, 1 John 4, 16 very early on. Um, and it's a very, very simple scripture piece. It's just God is love. Mm. And I really thought I knew what love was and what commitment was and what uh, emotions were. But with my relationship with Jesus, that just becomes a whole um, lifestyle, a whole thing that, you know, there's just love all around. And, um, and I, I guess... Um, I was tremendously fearful in my life before that. Uh, with all my television careers and um, all, everything I was doing, it was basically based around fear of having to be the best and therefore getting on top of your fear and insecurity. Whereas um, when I get into my scripture pieces and get into church, you know, I just find that there's this bottomless pit of love and grace and happiness sitting in the Bible. Now, you're a busy lad now because mm. you live, live there and, and, and I know you go to Watto's and other men's yep. sheds and occasions like that. Do you find that your experience relates to men? I mm. know it's not correct these times to talk these ways, but there are some things that a man hears best mm. through another. Do you find that that works? Oh, absolutely. I, I really believe in what uh, Ian Watson says, that like iron can only sharpen iron, only men can sharpen men. And, and I've had a huge amount of great experiences at men's gatherings or men's shed nights or, or whatever they are around the country. And I've had the privilege of being invited and, and speaking at some of those. Uh, but what I hear from other men it really strengthens me and really sends me back to my wife and children a better father and, and sends me into my workplace a better a workmate and, um, and a better husband, that's for sure, to, to Rebecca. So I, I find the men's movement around the country when we're talking about Jesus and talking about the goodness of the Bible and what we can do as men, as Australian men, to be tremendously powerful for me and for other men around me. And do you think in our Australian context we are reluctant as men, particularly sometimes? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think there's more to the Australian male than we could ever dream of. And if we can get other blokes to unlock the goodness in, in our friends and our mates and stand shoulder to shoulder with them and help, mm. help them kick down a few of their emotional doors mm. um, and, and unleash you know, the J-man on them, 
um, you know, great things are going to happen in this country because more men will stand up for uh, the man inside, the man inside them. Um, and I often ask this question to, to guests, really. Um, if, if someone were to ask you um, to explain the Christian faith to mm. them, how would you start the story and what would you want to say? Um, I'd I just basically say, look, um, there's nothing easy about being a Christian in this day and age where so much is uh, put on the table, so much seduction is out there in terms of acting unkindly or acting uh, unwisely or being foolish with money and possessions and, and people in our lives and things like that. That's the easy part. You know, to straighten up takes a real man mm. and uh, only with Jesus' help and his grace mm. can we possibly get away from those uh, worldly distractions and get on with being the best you, you could possibly be. Because we understand the Christian faith as being grace, mm. not by works. That's right. Uh, Though that's true, we'd like to think the Christian faith made, it, made us better people because of Christ. Always. So tell us what ways you feel the Christian faith has most impacted upon you. Um, I, I really think uh, I'm a very good mate now. Before I thought I was a very using person. I, I, would, I would find a very strong person to get close to and compete with them because I'd love the competition of that. And, and when I'd finally get in front of them, I'd drop them like a bad habit. And so what, what my Christian, Christian faith has done for me is um, it's really got, got me to be not such a menace to myself uh, and, and uh, try to be, and, and it, it's, it's very hard to explain, but uh, being a Christian has just made me a great deal softer mm. on myself. Yeah. And so therefore I can accept other people around yeah, me a lot easier. And in just 10 seconds, what about the future? What is it you? Um, I just following God as hard as I can, following God with more commitment than I have in the past. Um, just introducing God to my children in a very deep way. So he's at the dinner table, breakfast table, lunch table every single day. And so they know he is a force in their life because he's a force in my life. So I just want them to witness how strong he makes me so they can carry on with it for the rest of their lives. So Duncan, though, for, for many people, they'll associate you with that... Uh... Uh, less than two minutes in that pool in Seoul. In reality, your life's as real now and, and the future is just mm. as much an important part. Yeah, it's something I tell the blokes when I talk to them at men's gatherings and things like that, that I had a sensational life before I met Jesus. Uh, but now I've got a great life because of Jesus. It's more colourful, deep and exciting than it ever was before him. Thank you ever so much for coming on as a guest. A pleasure, Keith. Bless Thank you. you. We'll be back in just a few moments. It's been 200 years since the first Methodists met in Australia. To celebrate two centuries of faith and pioneering care, CEO and presenter Reverend Dr Keith Garner takes us back to where it all began. But we don't begin here at the heart of London. We begin in a town in the north of England. In this fascinating narrative, Reverend Garner chronicles the history of the life and times of the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. This fresh and thought-provoking documentary takes us on a journey throughout the United Kingdom, beginning in John Wesley's hometown of Epworth. John Wesley was born here on the 17th of June, 1703. This one-hour DVD travels on to his education years and beginnings of social justice in Oxford, to his final years in London. For more information on John Wesley, the man and his mission, Call 02-9263-5555 or email us at impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. Just like Duncan, everyone needs mentors to encourage and inspire. Wesley Mission's Aunties and Uncles program is just one way we're working to keep families and communities strong. Let's take a look together. Before Wesley Mission came along as our fairy godmother, uh, we were in dire straits. Aunties and uncles would have closed after nearly 40 years. Um, and probably about 5,000 children have gone through the program. So, um, and it's a great program because it keeps the children in the family. I've got family, but haven't spoken to them for 20 years. Um, and the girl has needed family and also my mum passed away only recently four years ago so I needed something more for the kids. So yeah, so I sort of like Googled them on the internet and off I went. I mean our world now it's totally different. I mean we're reattached also with my family so we've just got this massive family base now which is really good and they're beautiful people, we love them. I mean they look forward to every visit, you know, and I mean I suppose it gives us a break as well, and they get to enjoy different things, and I, I wouldn't have life any other way now. It's beautiful. 
they're, they're just great fun to be with. They're, they're full of activity all the time. They're on the go all the time. And we really have fun. When I first joined Aunties and Uncles, I wasn't even sure whether I'd be accepted because I was an older person and I was single and, you know, it was all about families. But I really don't think that matters. This has, you know, been an added dimension to my life, definitely. A lot of joy. Absolute lot of joy. Yes. She's, she's the niece that I don't have. Uh, she means a lot. Um, she's absolutely wonderful. We've been so many places and I've learned so much from her. Yeah, it does give you a lot of self-esteem and confidence knowing that you have got someone there and it's also another sort of moral support branch that you've got there. So, you know, in case your mum or your dad isn't there, I'm really happy that the Wesley Mission did take over because it's giving the opportunity to other young people and all the children and that to have another person there for them and to make them feel really special. So as I continue my exploration into the prophets, I've noticed that many of the prophets were very hesitant to go. You notice this if you study the Old Testament prophets, many of them didn't really want to go at first and do whatever it was that God asked them to do. But no one, no one in the Old Testament is as unwilling as Jonah. Now we know little about Jonah apart from his name. But let me read to you from the first chapters, the first chapter verses two and three. Go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it, because its wickedness has come upon us all. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port, and after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. See, Jonah was called to do something, called to go originally to the city of Nineveh. He ran away, he boarded a ship, he shirked his responsibility. How many times in life do people do that? And you see, the rest is history, the encounter with a large fish and all that goes with the Jonah story. But he comes face to face with his own wrong. That's one of the most important parts of the book of Jonah. The important thing about this prophet is that he eventually comes to do the thing that he was meant to do from the beginning. So as he comes face to face with his own wrong, so he realizes he's got to do whatever it is that God calls him to do. So I'm now reading from the third chapter and verses two to three. Go to the great city of Nineveh, same message, and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city and it took three days to go through it. So Jonah has now done an about turn. After running away, he comes back. And we find this again and again with prophets, but this is such a startling story and account of a prophet doing that. And what's also interesting is that the people of Nineveh responded and avoided the worst of outcomes. Now, God, of course, always knows the bigger picture. We only ever see in part. And Jonah couldn't possibly have known what the outcome was going to be, what the effect was going to be upon those people. And if we really study carefully Jonah, Jonah was actually angry with God at the, the mercy of God towards these people, that he allowed these people who turned back to him to be accepted. I mean, what a cheek in a way. Here's a prophet who's run away from God and now he's angry because God is showing mercy when in point of fact, God had shown mercy to him in allowing him that opportunity. I don't want to call it a second chance. It's, it's the, the first opportunity in one sense for him to turn back to God and do whatever he asks us to do. Now, I often look at, at, at prophets and, and say, what message has it got to do for us? What has it got to say to us? Responding to God when he asks us to do something is so very, very important. Life changes. We, we heard in Duncan's story something of his own sporting achievements and how life can change so quickly for us and how we might think we've reached a, a pinnacle of life and then something new comes along. For the prophet Jonah, I don't know what it was like when he was booking his ticket for that ship, but he thought he was heading off to do what he wanted to do in life but God had another plan for him. 
So when he responded to that plan, did what he's been asked to do and preached whatever it was he'd been told to give, when the people responded, he's angry. Angry at them uh, uh, being able to do all this and God willing to accept them. God's mercy is always far more generous, far more gracious and greater than ours. And that, perhaps above all else, is what we learn from the prophet Jonah. That if we're prepared to respond to him, don't ever be surprised at the, the breadth of God. There's a, there's a hymn that's often sung in churches that says, there's a wideness in God's mercy that is wider than the sea. That there's something in his grace, there's something in his love that is far softer than the harshness that is often theirs. That's why I asked um, Duncan what it was that coming to Christ had done for him. And he was prepared to say that perhaps it made him softer with himself and therefore softer with others, more generous with himself therefore more generous to others. It's, it's easy to talk about that when you've lived a very strict life of training and, and discipline, but all of us can be, can be harsh on ourselves. And therefore, when we're harsh on ourselves, we're often harsh on other people. God is soft towards us in that he loves us, he calls us, he accepts us. And because of that, Let's let the same things flow from our own lives into our relationships, into the way we treat other people. I don't expect that today we're going to get on a ship to head off to another place to try to avoid the presence of God. But I think the challenge is real. When he asks you to do it, do it. And when God is gracious to other people, don't be angry. Just be pleasured by that fact because it's true for you too. God bless you. If you would like to know more about today's topic or for more on Keith's message, contact Keith by writing to Wesley Mission, Post Office Box A5555, Sydney South 1235 or email impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. Many thanks for joining us. Duncan shared with us, didn't he, that without a vision, a plan, you, you can't really live life. In fact, you can't reach your goals. Today, we've seen that when our vision aligns with God's, that's a whole new dimension. See you next week. Until then, goodbye and God bless you.